So welcome, Barry Prison, to this short talk, and thank you that you have been a fantastic speaker at the Autism Forum here in Zurich. So what I would be interested in is you said in your speech that the problem is sometimes that people in the autistic spectrum are blamed for something. And yes. reality would be that if we, so the so-called normal, would understand what it is all about, that the blame should be on us and not on them. Yes. Um, and I would say the responsibility should be on us in terms of helping people with autism to do better. And what I meant when I said too often people are blamed, we say, well, if the child's not cooperating, is he doing that intentionally? Um, is it just bad behavior? Uh, is he, for example, stimming just to avoid us? Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's the reason that that's happening? And so often we find if we change what we do, and if we're sensitive to those signals, that the child or the autistic person will do better. Um, but we want to understand why a person is behaving the way they are. And you can't say, well, he does that because he's autistic. Mm -hmm. Because an autistic person might relate much better to one person than to another person. Mm. And obviously the difference is in the relationship and how well that person feels comfortable with that other person. You quoted young Robert Kennedy. Yes. Who said that this is a catastrophe. So to be in this autistic spectrum is catastrophe for the people themselves, but also for the family. Yes. Why is it possible that somebody liberal, intelligent oh. in the US is saying something like that about the phenomenon. Yes, and, and that is fascinating because he is very liberal and you would expect that he would be more exactly. understanding. Yes. The reason is that he is an environmentalist and as part of his belief system, he believes that vaccinations cause autism. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, and that leads to looking at autism as a tragedy because he's trying to make his point okay. about that, yes. Okay. What I find interesting is that I think we think of us as being tolerant. But I see sometimes that we are much less tolerant when it comes to problematic behavior yes. than before. Because everything today has a name. And as soon as the name pops up, the diagnosis pops up. Yes. We separate these people and put them in boxes. That's right. Yes. And the term that we use for that is we see them as other. We other them. Yes. So taking that word and making it into a verb. Um, and I think that happens for a lot of reasons because sometimes problematic behavior, whether it's screaming or dropping to the floor or running down the hallway, um, it violates the cultural and the social norms, that's number one. Number two is as parents and as professionals, that makes us feel incompetent. Mm -hmm. That makes us feel that we're not being successful. And I think a lot of times that's when the switch and the blame goes to the child because we don't want to look at ourselves. Right. And we don't want to say, what did I do wrong? Did I speak too loudly? Did I touch the child when the yes. child is sensitive to touch? Yes. Something that I find interesting is I know people who have a child in the autistic spectrum. One lady afterwards will be on the panel and she will be talking about this. But every other person I talk to, they don't want to talk about this, even though they have yes. a child in this spectrum. Why are people not openly accepting that this is something we should discuss? Uh, the problem behavior mm -hmm. issue? Uh, b because it gets into that issue of who's to blame. I think it brings back, especially for parents, it brings back a lot of what we call negative emotional memories. Uh, who wants to think about things that stress you out in your life? Mm -hmm. I think there's another issue also. Um, parents especially don't want to see their son or daughter looked at as a behavior problem, as a bad kid. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I'm going to be doing a one-hour talk just coming up about understanding problem behavior from what we call an emotional regulation approach. In other words, the child can't stay well regulated, doesn't have the coping skills mm -hmm. to deal with stress. Mm -hmm. So a 10, 12, 15 year old person with autism may react as if, a, as if they're three years of age or, or four years of age because they don't have 
the strategies to stay calm and to deal with that degree of stress. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in Switzerland, we're always proud of what we do for minorities. We are a rich country, but when it comes to the autism and the autism spectrum, we are far, far behind. Yes. Do you have any idea why this is like that? I, I don't, and I would have expected that, that Switzerland would be more me, advanced. Me too. Uh, I didn't know about this. And right. I'm not sure whether, you know, how much it has to do with maybe a culture that is very proud of things like manners, mm -hmm. of good behavior, mm -hmm. um, uh, of, for example, a child respecting parents, respecting the elders. Uh, and of course, people and children with autism violate a lot of those expectations mm -hmm. much of the time. You but deal I, with this issue for 50 years now. Yes. You said 50 years, which is amazing. Yeah. When you look back at the time when you started and now, what has really changed? Ah, uh, one of the things that has changed dramatically and most recently is autistic people telling us what helps them and what does not help them. What is life like for them? Up until a few decades ago, Temple Grandin was the only person who could say, you want to know what it feels like to have autism? Ask me. <laughs> and when that happened, everybody went, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Yeah. I think that's one of the major changes. I think the whole concept of neurodiversity is another change. And that goes well beyond autism. Right. That goes for people with learning disabilities, um, all kinds of different ways of seeing the world and of processing information. So I think the concept of neurodiversity which says, wait a second, these people are not less or just deviant or deficient. They have different brains, so they deal with the world differently. And one of the things I spoke about earlier today, discovering that some of these neurodiverse people also have great talents right. and great abilities. Right. Uh, let, let me jump on that because sure. we talked about Greta Thunberg. You mentioned Albert Einstein when you talked about this autism spectrum. And I'm not so sure, because these are famous people. Greta is the superstar of the climate change yes. movement. And I think sometimes that may be probably not so good, because people can say, oh, look, that's not a problem. Look at them. They are fantastic. They are very intelligent. They are bright. They are faring well in life. Isn't that a problem that we now focus on these exceptions and think this is the rule? Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a great question. Uh, I think what it does is they are kind of prototypical examples of people with very, very scattered peaks and valleys mm -hmm. in their development. I'm sure when Greta Thunberg was very young, she didn't appear to be very social. No. She probably didn't want to play with other children. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think that you know, we have to also look at the other side of the coin, and that is what led her to be a leader in climate change? Uh, her parents, or at least significant people in her life, probably said, Greta, you know so much about this. You can be so helpful. But Greta, if she was not in an environment where people respected her, and they said, you have to stop talking about climate change. Enough already. Go to your room. Yeah, exactly. She might have ended up with yeah. serious mental health issues yeah. because people on the spectrum, as bright as they are, are at risk mm -hmm. for those secondary mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, who knows? You know, I think it's a lesson in seeing those abilities and nurturing those abilities because it has everything to do with a person's self-esteem and self-image. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of talk now about helping people with autism find an identity, mm -hmm. um, a purpose in life. And it doesn't have to be somebody who's a genius in what they do. <laughs> I mean, all people do better if they have a purpose in life. Sure. And that's, I think that's become a very healthy focus now in autism. It could be a person who's just a little bit better in an area. Um, and could, I know non-speaking people who are gainfully employed right now. Yes. The jobs may do that they may do are very simple, but they know they can do them, Fantastic. and that's big. Last question: Could one goal be that we try to make people in the autistic spectrum the new normal? Ah, uh, I don't know so much about the new normal, but I think what's important to say is let's move them from that category of different and deviant into that full spectrum we talk about right now. Um, and even 
in explaining autism to an autistic person, the way to do it is to say everybody's good at some things. Everybody's not so good at other things. Mm -hmm. okay, I never liked skiing. I am not going to become a skier. Okay? <laughs> it's really sweet to say that. <laughs> I know, I know. But, but I'm a drummer and I play oh, in a band. Okay. Um, and I could say I'm a pretty good drummer. Mm -hmm. You know, young guys look at me and say, hey, for an old guy, you're a good drummer. <laughs> so I, I think it's important for each one of us to celebrate what we're good at, yep. to develop that self-awareness. Yeah and seek out those opportunities to show what we're good at, but at the same time understand that there are some things we're not so good at. Yeah. Of course, a lot of this is easier said than done. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. Barry, I can tell you, you're not only a great drummer, you're a fantastic <laughs> speaker, and it was a great pleasure and honor for me to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you so much for your contribution. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. You.